had a good week? Hello? Echo? All right. As we gather this morning, our, we come together in an in attitude of worship, but only if we are aware of God's presence in our lives. So if we say, have you had a good week? Maybe yes, and maybe it's been challenging, but you're here, and that is good news. It is a season of epiphany. Epiphany is a season of aha moments, of revelation, of going, oh, so that's what was going on. All through the season of Advent, we've been preparing for this child to come. And, and on Christmas, we celebrated Emmanuel, that God is with us. And then in the first week of January, we pack it all up and put it in its boxes and hope that it will stay in its boxes until next year. But Epiphany will not be denied. The wise men come and they see and they experience. They, they were following a star all that time and it led them to a little stable, a, a hovel, if you will. And inside were not kings and queens, but peasants. A teenage girl and her bewildered husband and all of the animals and all of the smells that go with animals. And they recognized that they were in the presence of something different. And they went, aha, God is up to something. And they laid before him those three gifts. You know them well. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And they recognized that God was doing a new thing. When we come for worship on Sunday morning, it is for that revelation it is to recognize that God is doing a new thing in your life, that the past is prologue for the future, that God is preparing you for something. And oftentimes we can become bewildered, can't we? We can follow a star and we end up in Albuquerque. I always liked Albuquerque because it was always where Daffy Duck and Bugs Bunny ended up in the cartoon series. Oftentimes it means that we started at one place and we end up somewhere completely different. And so what we do in our time together is we make that hope come alive. What we will do in the rest of the year is make it come alive. Not just something that you learn about or you, that you show up on Sunday morning, but a faith that goes beyond Sunday morning, that shapes and redefines how you see yourself and how you see all of the activities, the events, the, the, the challenges, the struggles, the uncertainty, the wonders, that you look for wonders, you look for opportunities. You seek them out because you know that they're there. But we recognize that God is a God that invites you. He's inviting you to see yourself differently. So we began this series that we've been calling Unstuck. Because the challenge is, is for all of us is we can become stuck. We can get into our routines and our routines become comfortable and predictable and safe and easy and dull and dry, but they're known. There's an old story about, you know, what's called battered women's syndrome. Even though it's miserable and we hate it, it's predictable, it's known. And so we endure the hardship, we endure the mundane and the boring because it's known, it's simple, it's easy. Discipleship, Christianity is hard work. And it's not for the faint of heart, and it's not for the weekend warrior. It's for those that are willing to roll up their sleeve and get messy. That's my theme for this morning, if you haven't, if you're trying to write it down. Are you ready to get messy? Right? Are you ready to get messy? If you open up your bulletin, and I know that you're all doing it because I don't know if you realize this. I can see you, and you can see me. Do you have your bulletin? And in your bulletin, there's this thing. And I, and I put them in there particularly because I know that you like to color or that you like to do something. It's called sermon notes. And the sermon notes are intended for us to be students of the scriptures, for us to be learners, to be in a, what we called this morning an apprenticeship. You are an apprentice to the master. And so we invite you to learn and to experience what God is doing in your life. We began by saying that you make your choices 
and that your choices make you. Well, that obviously begs a question, doesn't it? What choices have you already made that will bear themselves out in the future? Right? Maybe you decided to show up this morning, and I can tell that because here you are. That choice will have an impact. That sense of devotion, that sense of commitment that you actually got up this morning, tied your shoes, combed your hair, for those of you that have hair, uh, but that's another matter. And then you showed up and you said, I am going to do this because God is doing something in my life. You make a choice and then your choices make you. But the question is, is do we ever get stuck and the problem is, is we often have a different view of life. Most of us, the vast majority of the public, view life sort of like this. Do you ever see it like this? This is the life that you think that you want. Maybe the, the life that you think you should have. The life that you deserve. But more importantly, perhaps the life that you pretend that you have. Right? That, that life is easy. That you always goes up and life is good, and that once you become a person of faith, life makes its way in a very neat, tidy way. For those of you that have ever really cracked a Bible and have actually read anything in the Gospels, you recognize this is not the life that we live. This is not my life. This is not my story. This is my story. I was going on happy as a clam when God said, I want you to do a new thing. And I said, no, I don't want to. And he said, we can either do this the easy way or we can do it my way. My life has been a story of mess, of uncertainty, of unpredictability. Maybe yours is too. Maybe this is your life. Maybe you feel like you started down one path and everybody expected it to go up and go to the, to the right, but maybe you got waylaid and things never worked out the way you thought it would. It never, life never turns out to be like the Brady Bunch, right? It's a half hour, and in that half hour, there's a lot of singing and dancing. There's a problem, but that so problem gets solved by the end of the story, and everybody lives in a white picket fence. Is, does that sound like you? Because that's not the Christian story. Is this the life that you experience? Is this the life that you fear? Is it the life that is often messy? Is it the life that you pretend that you don't have? So imagine for a moment that you actually gathered in a room where people brought their mess together. See, I often thought about, have you ever noticed that whenever people greet each other nowadays, whenever you see somebody, you, you might say something like, good morning, how are you? Fine, how are you? It's just the normal, it's just regurgitating, right? You don't really think about it, you just say it. But imagine if you said, good morning, how's your mess today? How's your mess? Because I already know that you're a mess. I already mo know that there's uncertainty. I already know that your life is filled with things that are unpredictable and unsafe. So can we at least be honest and acknowledge how is your mess? And, and then would you be willing to pause and listen for an honest, heartfelt answer? In church, of all places, this is where we recognize life is messy. I'm messy. You're messy. Whenever you get people together, it becomes messy. And into that messy came this Hebrew rabbi. And that Hebrew rabbi began to help people to see their mess from a different perspective. Not as something to be avoided or shunned or silenced or hidden or put out of town, but something to recognize that it made you who you are. It, it, it had the potential to strengthen you. Your mess has the potential to strengthen you. It has the potential to clarify. It has the potential to humanize you. 
to make you more human than you really are. Because see, most of the time, one of the great sins of humanity is the realization that we are God. We have it all together. We have everything we need. We don't need anybody or anything. When in fact, you're hiding the mess. You, you're hiding behind a mask. And so if we want to take off and we want this year to be new, if we want to believe that we were made for more than just going through the motions or hiding our mess or pretending and, and hoping that people don't see what's really going on, if we want life to be different, then we have to acknowledge that we were made for more than just going through the motions. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of just kind of going through and doing the same old, same old. Maybe 2023 will be the year. One of the things that we have to recognize as we begin a new year and we face our mess is we have to recognize that excuses are not reasons. One of the things that we often have a temptation to do is maybe you got up this morning and you said, I, you know, I, I just don't feel like I, I've, been, I've worked really hard this week and I'm really tired and I need some me time. And what we do is we confuse that. That is what we call an excuse. But we like to interpret it, especially when it's in our favor, as a reason. Well, the reason that I can't go. See, it's a lot different if you say the reason that I cannot be a, in a Bible study or that I cannot do spiritual disciplines is because I'm not as smart as everybody else or I'm not as clever. That's not a reason. That's an excuse. Behind every excuse is a festering fear. I love that word festering because it brings up this idea that it's kind of fomenting under the surface. It's something that is like unseen, but it's under there. It's growing in intensity. It's becoming control and be in charge. And you will then step out and be bold. Then you become limitless. What is the fear this year that is holding you back from deeper connection with God. I have found, I've thought about this for quite some time, and I found that there are, like a lot of things, three fundamental or limiting fears that are infecting the vast majority of the people. The reason that most of these, these pews or these chairs are not filled this morning is because of limiting beliefs. And I want you to think about it. And after the service, I will be over here in the, in the glass room if you want to have a conversation. And I want to hear whether you think any of these are valid. The first one is, is the simplest one. It is our Facebook friends. You probably already know what I think about Facebook. Facebook makes us very lonely liars. We love to lie on Facebook because we are anonymous. We can put it out there. I think it is fascinating to see the number of people that will post things like, hey, everybody, look at what I'm eating today. I don't really care what you're eating today. <laughs> but you want me to know. You want the world to know what you're eating today. We have become lonely liars. We, we have taken our mess and we hide it behind a facade of glory and wonder. Look at how perfect my life is. And then, of course, it infects everybody else. And they look at it and they kind of go, but look at my life isn't at all like that. And what you do is you pick out little snippets from everybody's life, the perfection of everybody's life. And you string it together and go, my life is a mess. I can't let people know. I get a cartoon that is delivered to my uh, desk. Somebody gave me a cartoon from, per, per, I don't know if you've ever seen it, Pearls Before Swines. What a name, but what a great name of a cartoon. And it talks about this very thing. In this cartoon, here is Ashley. And Ashley gets up every morning before she wants to. She sits in traffic for hours. She goes to a crappy job that she dreads. And then she takes the kids everywhere all the time. She looks forward to one weekend, one week out of the year. And then she posts, man, living the party life, the beach life. And everybody that sees it says, wow, doesn't Ashley have a great life? I wonder how she does it. She's got a perfect life, not at all like mine. 
Does that seem familiar? I, th I thought it was funny that it was sort of that it was a cartoon, and yet it's kind of one of those that makes you laugh kind of nervously, go, <laughs> yeah, that, that seems strange, doesn't it? Do you have Facebook friends, virtual friends, but no intimacy? The second problem that we often have is what is called the illusion of prosperity. The illusion of prosperity means that you think you have control. You have money, you have power, you have insurance. You can control everything until you can't. And so you don't need church, you don't need anything. Church is long term. You're short, short term. You have everything that you could possibly want except meaning. Until you have it all and you kind of go, is this all that I am? For those kind of people, I would refer you to the great treaty on the subject written by the wisest man that ever lived, Solomon, who wrote Ecclesiastes. Vanity of vanity, it's all vanity. It's just chasing after the wind. What does it all mean? Some people have Facebook friends. They, they lack the connection. Some people have the illusion of control, of prosperity. And of course, there are some people that have the fear of missing out or what is in our term called FOMO. It is where scarcity and shame collide. I have to be chasing. I have to do sports on the weekend. And the reason is because is everybody else is doing it. And if I don't do it, I'm going to be missing out. And people are going to think I'm a horrible parent. And I'm not sure what I'm going to do if I don't do what everybody else is doing. It's where shame and scarcity collide. I don't want to be left out. I don't want to be alone. And so maybe you see some of that. Maybe you don't. Maybe you see it in family. Maybe you don't. Maybe there are other things that are infecting you that are keeping you from your best self. We are here as a church. Jesus came to help you see yourself, to reflect back to you what true humanity was meant to be and invite you to become what we call unstuck, moving beyond your excuses. It's always somebody else's fault. My life isn't messy or my life's not supposed to be messy. My life is supposed to be perfect. Now, in case you think that this is just a story about society or human behavior or technology, it's not. The Bible is full of stories of people whose lives were a mess, but they took the risk. They did the unthinkable, and they found the wonders that they never imagined possible. My favorite in this line, the, the person that had it all and was empty and broken was a, a little guy. You know him well. His name was Zacchaeus. And if you're a kid, you learn that song, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. I won't sing it, because that's not my thing. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And the Lord said, Zacchaeus, you come down. I'm going to your house today. Let's take a look at that story and see if we can find a way out of this malaise that we find ourselves in. Now, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through, and a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. Now, he was a chief, not just one of the worker bees. He was the chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the cloud. So, he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. Now, when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and he welcomed him gladly. And all the people that saw this began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him, Today 
Salvation has come to this house because this man, too, is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. This is the word of God for the people of God. What a character. Would you not ever want to just sit down for just a little bit with Zacchaeus and say, tell me that story again. Tell me that story about how you had it all. You were the chief tax collector. What that meant was he was working with the political powers. He was a political operative. He was working with the Romans to collect taxes. And the idea was is that he would, that you had to collect so much for the Romans, but if you could squeeze more out of other people, you could get that too. But he was not just a tax collector, not just one among many. It tells us he was the chief. He had risen up in ranks. He had a man of privilege and of power, of political operative, and he was wealthy. He had it all, but it wasn't enough. I... I've heard about this guy, this Jesus, that is saying some pretty strange things, that's saying it's about more that, that because as soon as I die, in, in Solomon's writing in Ecclesiastes, Solomon says, as soon as you die, all of that goes to somebody else. And I imagine Zacchaeus said, I, I just want to know that I'm, I was meant for more, right, than just taxes and collecting. And so he climbs up in a sycamore tree and he is recognized. I think everybody needs somebody to see them like Jesus does. Jesus sees Zacchaeus. And the important thing is he calls him by name. He makes it personal. He doesn't just say, hey, you, the guy up in the tree, what are you doing? Zacchaeus, you're a real person with a real story. When we talk about evangelism, we're not talking about knocking on doors and saying, why are you not in church? We're talking about making it personal. You're a real person with a real story that God created and God is inviting you to experience. Who needs to be seen and heard and touched the way Jesus touched people? There's a couple of things about Zacchaeus story that I think can help us today get out of our mess or deal with the honesty that we need. The first thing that Zacchaeus had is he had what is called a Jesus encounter. He didn't just hear about Jesus. He wanted to go farther. He wanted an interaction. He wanted a contact. Jesus, Zacchaeus heard about Jesus. And so he climbed up. He couldn't get through the normal way. But he wasn't going to be deterred. He was going to risk it all. He's going to risk his name. He actually climbed up in a sycamore tree. And if you know anything about um, Middle Eastern culture, you know that that kind of activity of, of a grown man climbing up a tree would have been nothing but shame and embarrassment. But he didn't care. Right? He was going to risk it all because he wanted to be more than just a tax collector. And when Jesus called him by name, it was the thing that could bring him out of the tree. How many people do you know that are stuck in a tree? They want something more. They just don't know where. They just don't know what to look. And so they look on Facebook. They look to their wealth or their power. They pretend behind masks and pretend that it's not really for them. Maybe you're in that boat as well. Maybe you've come this morning in order to climb a tree and say, maybe today is the day he will call me by name. Maybe today is the day that he sees me. Jesus is calling you. You can feel it. You know it deep down inside. There is a huge difference between being interested in Jesus and being committed to Jesus. The first thing that happens with Zacchaeus is it tells us that he could not get there the simple, easy way. Have you ever noticed that the things that are the hardest are often the things that are the greatest and have the most meaning to us? They are the things that refine us. Zacchaeus just couldn't go up on the line like everybody else. 
He had to go even farther, and that's what made the difference. He wasn't just interested. He was committed to getting there. And it tells us because he couldn't do that, so he climbed up in a sycamore tree. He was not going to be denied. He was not going to stop with, well, the timing wasn't quite right. I was busy that day. I had other things to do. There was nothing that was going to keep him from that moment. He had a Jesus encounter. The first thing that has to happen in your mess is you have to make it personal. You have to have a Jesus encounter. Nothing will move your spirit more than having Jesus call you by name. The second thing that happened for Zacchaeus is he made it public. He made it public. Jesus says, Zacchaeus, come on down. I'm going to go to your house, which was an open invitation to, to acceptability and respectability. Zacchaeus, you are the chief tax collector, but I want to come and I want to dine with you. And of course, Zacchaeus recognizes that he has been in the presence of a different kind of person. And he stands up and he says, right now, Lord, I give half my possessions to the poor. Raise your hand this morning if you would be willing to give half of your wealth to the poor. Here we go. We got one. Do you understand how personal this made it? This wasn't just theory. This wasn't just philosophy or theology. He made it public. He went public with what he said, what he believed, who he was. He stood up and said, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions. And, and if I have cheated anybody, and I've cheated a few, I'm going to give back four times. He understood the power of making that public statement. When we do baptism, we make a public statement. Do you remember your baptism vows? Do you remember the acceptance that you have entered in to become, an, to become an apprentice of the master? He owns it all. When it becomes public, it becomes powerful. When you're willing to share your story and your faith journey, it becomes powerful. You own it. This is who I am. Zacchaeus took his mess, took his background, his tax collector status, his wealth and everything, and said, Lord, it's yours. It's always been yours. And now I give it back to you. He made it public. And then, of course, he had to make it accountable. Accountability is what binds the desire to the results. It is our decision, our choice, our vows that we make and we say, but you can hold me accountable to this. By doing it the way Zacchaeus did in the middle of a dinner, I'm giving half of my possessions. Everybody there was going to hold him accountable to that. When you make, when you're a part of a small group, when you're a part of a Bible study, they can hold you accountable. How are you doing with the vows that you have made? Who is holding you accountable? If you're not being held accountable, then it isn't really going to go very far. At the beginning of everybody's year, we always make New Year's resolutions. And of course, you know, what is the number one resolution most people make? I want to lose weight, right? I want to join a gym. I want to get back in shape. I want to get my body toned and all that kind of stuff. But oftentimes when it becomes hard and it becomes hard, whatever it is that you're going to try and do that is meaningful, it becomes hard. It's easy to give up if nobody knows. If nobody's aware of what you're trying to do. But imagine if you came to church, and I'm just throwing that in there because this is where we are. But imagine you came to church every week and somebody said to you, hey, how are you doing with that diet? Every week, I'm going to ask you that. Every week, I'm going to ask you, hey, did you go to the gym this week? Remember, you said that that's really important to you. Or maybe you begin the year by saying, you know what I would really like to do? I would really like to read through the entire Bible, through the Bible study programs that we have at the church. Hey, that's great. How about I, I just ask you about how you're doing it? 
pretty soon you're either going to get tired of making up excuses or you're actually going to give it a try. Accountability, being accountable, is what binds the desire to the result. This is why John Wesley was so adamant about a small group. If you want to grow as a disciple, if you want to become more than an almost Christian, if you want to be an altogether Christian, you have to be a part of a group. A group is what is going to hold you accountable. How are you doing? Are you making progress or are you just treading water? Zacchaeus had people in his life that knew he had made a change. They were going to hold him to it. To hear Jesus' words, salvation has come to this house. It hadn't been here before, but salvation because this man is a son of Abraham. He restored him to his rightful place. And he could do the same for you if you're interested, if you're willing, if you're ready. So let me ask you, what's holding you back? Have you gone up the tree yet? Have you wondered if you were made for more than just making more money, watching the stock market, painting your house, fixing your cars? Is that all that there is to you? Are you part of a bigger story? Does your life go on beyond the grave? And then what? There were three wise men, and they, they went from Persia all the way from just following a star, and life came alive. They found that that child really lived and really changed their world. What's your plan? What will be different about this year? How consistent are you? Is it a once a month or a once a year? And who's leading you? Where will it lead? What is your ultimate purpose in life? The child grew and he said a lot of other things. And in the weeks ahead, we will continue to explore how you can be different, how he is calling you out of the tree to tell you that salvation has come to this house as well. Are you ready to come down and begin the journey? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise this morning. Your word challenges us to leave our comfort and convenience, to struggle, to give away all that we cannot control, to find all that we cannot lose. Help us, Father, and help those that are struggling to believe that it is all for real, that you really did come, and that there's so much more waiting for us. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.